Declaration is I work for Gamma Healthcare. I also work with a couple of universities. And if you've got insomnia, Brett Mitchell, Phil Russo, and I will send you to sleep at night if you're into podcasts. And I'm going to talk about some things you can do physically and also some behavioral stuff that we're going to do. Now, uh, this is from the era when I started as a nurse, actually. This is about a year after I started. And Dennis Mackey was the go to man for IV lines. You know, if, if he spoke at a conference, you turned up. But people just didn't believe that the environment, air, water, had really much to do with healthcare associated infection at all. So, this is the area that I trained in. And do you know what? There's still a lot of nurses around who think they learned stuff back in the 1980s and don't need to learn it again. Whereas I spent my entire career relearning and unlearning and relearning and unlearning. And I, I have no problem in saying I was wrong. And I've said it a lot over the last year because um, I think that's a strength, not a weakness. But plenty of people still think that they learned it a long time ago and they don't need to carry on. <clears throat> so what can we do with what we've got? I think firstly, we do what we're already supposed to be doing well. And I'll come back to that in a, in a bit. Uh, and then look for opportunities to change practice when things are really not going very well. And then look at maybe other new technologies that might help, especially if they're high up in the hierarchy of controls. And I, I'm not going to dwell on this, but you know, uh, we all know that elimination is the best control measure and PPE is the worst control measure. But we seem to be resorting to PPE a lot at the moment and not going much further up that hierarchy of controls. I'm fascinated by masking now. The public seem to have forgotten that they're a filter and you're inhaling through them, that's the sort of point. So the outside of it is going to be contaminated because you're sucking everything towards you and then you just handle the outside of the mask and stick it in your bag. And now who takes the filter out of your hoover at home and starts rubbing the outside of it just to see what's on it? It's not there. So elimination, when we're talking COVID, it's stay at home, isn't it? Which worked possibly for a while until people started to go for eye tests in Barnard Castle, in which case they didn't think they had to stay at home anymore. So that mess has got blown completely. Substitution is easy. You go shopping at Amazon, then you don't have to go out. Uh, what about the engineering controls? Um, can we do something about that? Well, ventilation definitely helped, I think. And opening the windows makes such a big difference. Uh, about six weeks ago, my mother broke a hip. And I went, I, I was down to see her. And they allowed me to go in very quickly. Because funnily enough, it was the, fir the ward I first worked on as a student nurse back in 1981. And she was in the bay I first went into. And I remember going in there thinking, God, this is a really stuffy, horrible room. And there was no air circulating at all. There, was, there were windows, but they were all shut. And it felt horrible. And this was like 8 o'clock in the morning, so it was early. They let me bob in quickly. And there's six of them in the bay. All elderly ladies, all fractured necks of femur. So they're not getting up and running around. And they're not going and sitting and talking to each other's beds. And then three days later, she rings me up and says, oh, they found out a lady in the, bay opposite, in the bed opposite in the corner has got COVID. So I thought, well, you're all going to get it. And lo and behold, all five got it. So nobody's thinking, do we open the windows? Or what's the ventilation like? I suspect they hadn't checked the CO2. You know, they're a no-brainer, really. I was lecturing at the University of... Reading a few weeks ago, 10th floor, load of tissue viability nurses. I've got a CO2 meter over there. It's reading about 800 at the moment. It was 700 and something until those doors over there got shut. But it's still acceptable air quality. And, um, and within about five minutes of speaking, it's over 2,000. So there's no ventilation. It's warm, and there's air being brought in, but it's mechanical ventilation. So we open the windows, and it drops down to 700 very, very quickly. This is not rocket science. The other thing, if it goes over 2,000, your audience nod off as well, no matter how good you are. So, so you know, what can we do about it? Can we actually think about changing the activity? I mean, I can remember ward handovers, where you squeeze eight nurses into the office for confidentiality to do handover, which lasts an hour in a room that's meant for two people. What's the air quality like in that? So think about areas where there is poor you know, ventilation. And, and then you know, if you've only got recirculation and no outdoor air supply, then you've got a problem. Uh, and so I think CO2 meters have got a, 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 a use. Um, it, in trains are fascinating. I have to say, having bought that, I watch it all the time. And there's some trains you, you're going on, and it's five, 600. And others you're sitting on, and it's 3,000 in a half full train. So that's really not brilliant. And you go into the next carriage, and it's 700. So there's something wrong in the individual ventilations in the different carriages as well. At uh, the IPS conference, interestingly, um, la week for, no, last week up in Liverpool, it never went above 600 in any room at any stage. So that tells me they're bringing in lots of lovely fresh air. And it was plenty warm, but they're bringing fresh air and warming it. Uh, and so I felt very comfortable, I have to say, uh, with that. Uh, people have looked at putting air, local air cleaning in. So this is a paper from Kirsty Busing in the University of Melbourne. 
where they found even though their isolate, well, their side rooms had 12 air changes an hour, they were still getting aerosols coming out of the room. Um, so they put in just small portable Samsung air cleaners with HEPA filters in the room uh, and managed to clean up the air very effectively, quite cheap, about 300 quid, bought from the local hardware store. Um, and then Brett Mitchell and Phil Russo put those into the hotels in um, Melbourne and Sydney because evidently the hotels they were putting people into in Melbourne had no balconies or windows that would open. Uh, so, so the, and the air recirculates from room to room to room. So if you didn't have COVID when you were going in there in quarantine, you had it by the time you came out. So that was not great. So they put a load of the air filters in those. They bought thousands of them. Uh, they're not a substitute for ventilation, but they certainly can help. Um, and if you've got HEPA filter, fine. And uh, Kath Noakes says that UV devices are, are, are potentially helpful as well, but not some of the others because we don't have the evidence. CO2 detectors can be useful, but not if you're, you're cleaning the air because it's not going to clean up the CO2. You can try segregating and screening, uh, and we don't have enough isolation facilities in the UK. We definitely don't. I mean, I can remember, well, I remember the days when I knew all the MRSA patients by their first name, and you had plenty of side rooms, and that very long time went. And, um, and then I can also remember the day when I thought, great, I've got to write an algorithm in the hospital to detect all the ESBL, so I'll start isolating them. So I started on the Monday and gave up Tuesday because we just didn't have enough isolation facilities. And that's before all the carbon penna resistant organisms that now challenge us. So there's a few possibilities. So um, I saw this one at the IPS conference. This is, um, what's it called? Uh, architectural walls. Uh, so they were exhibiting for the first time and they, they build modular units in industry and, and in offices, but they also built this so you can actually build uh, sections of side rooms and it's negative pressure with the HEPA filter, about 3.6 uh, by three meters. So you could put that into a space. I mean, I have to say 10 years ago at Southport where I worked, we did convert some bays to single rooms, but we went from six beds to three. So if you can afford to lose beds, that might help. But if you can't afford to lose beds, that's not going to help. There's the Bioquel pod as well, a couple of days to build it. So it's not an instant solution, but it's happened with 12 air changes. And now these are not negative pressure isolation rooms, though you have no anti rooms, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, in this paper from Joe Keward and John Otter and colleagues from Alder Hay, they found it did reduce the number of isolation days missed. Because they, you know, they reckon they were missing 75% of their opportunities to isolate because they just didn't have the facilities. And the third option is quick to put up, but it's very, very temporary and quick to take down. And we did actually use that at Nightingale 2. Uh, we didn't have any isolation facilities in Nightingale 1 because everybody was COVID. Nightingale 2, nobody was supposed to be COVID. But that's uh, what then happened was somebody brought in a rule that you've actually got to have two negatives before you get transferred to Nightingale 2. So if, if you end up in A&E and just need to be a rehab, they can't send you straight to Nightingale 2. You actually had to sit in the hospital for t a couple of days to get your negative COVID swabs, by which time you picked up COVID. So when we tested you when you got to, to Nightingale 2, you were. We did use it for, for C. diff, uh, but it doesn't work everywhere. You know, it works in some hospitals, it definitely doesn't work in others. And it's not a negative pressure isolation room. It's meant for contact and droplet. And Elaine will tell you it won't work in her system because it messes with the air flows. So you have to think very carefully. It's easy enough in there because that's just a huge exhibition center, which is a you know, slightly different uh, scenario. Um, that was an interesting experience to say the least. So screens, you'll find them all over the place. I turned up at the uni yesterday to lecture and I've got a big desk in front of me with a screen and then right in front of that, so probably about, about two meters away, there's a pull-up plastic screen in front of me that's this wide. I'm thinking, what good is this? I mean, they're for a droplet. You know, what, so what, what, what use is that going to be at all, apart from sticking a barrier between me and the students? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, they're fine. I suppose they might stop a droplet, but actually what they do if you stand there close to one in Tesco's is you'll see just how many people do shed droplets into that area, but, but also how bad their cleaning is as well, because some of them you can hardly see the poor person behind the counter because they're so smeared. So no great evidence to support them. You know, room ventilation is far better. Just sticking a screen up does not solve your problems, and they, they can even interfere with air flows. I've heard Kath Noakes say that they interfere with air flows. Um, there's a suggestion that they may help if you can place the patient by the extract and then screen them off a bit so that actually what's coming off them is likely to go out of the air uh, that way. But if you know, the air can stagnate and they could actually block air flows to things like the, uh, the um, 
uh, the smoke detector, so that's not going to be particularly helpful. There was a paper, though, a few years ago from 2008 from China, from Hong Kong, where they showed that full-length curtains pulled down the length of the bed did seem to make some difference, and that um, resonates with this paper here from Kath Noakes, from whether well, she did some work in the TB ward in Peru, where they used compu computational fluid dynamics uh, for this mechanically ventilated ward, and they put in a, a full-length divider between the beds, and they're actually able to separate off the airflows. So, you know, other people have been working on this for so long, and actually, uh, it's, uh, we just didn't look at it. You know, we missed it completely. There are so many other specialties out there who can help us in infection prevention and control. We've been working on this for years. I mean, I never read indoor air, but I do now. <laughs> but I, you just didn't forever. And I, you know, so we were all droplet, 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 which is, you know, I mean, how do my, you know, my mother's room, they're all meters and meters apart. They're all in the 90s. They're not mobile. How are they going to get a droplet onto the next person, even with a run up? They're not going to make it. <laughs> so, so, so it has to be air. I mean, how long have we learned about sinks? Christine talked about, you know, if we don't learn from our history. Actually, Andreas Voss put up a paper about sinks in his papers of the year at ICPIC a couple of weeks ago, but not to say here's a good paper. It was to say, for God's sake, we've known about this forever. Please, no more papers on sinks. Why don't we just do something about it? And this is an early one from 1970 where they put a boiling mechanism to actually get rid of the pseudomonas down the sink traps. But we don't, we don't seem to have learned about this. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, here's a paper that 10 years ago, now 12 years ago, 33% of people die from a pseudomonas due to poor design. It's not a surprise we find these organisms down the sink. They'll grow up in biofilm from the sewage system, and actually we put them into the sink. That's the point of hand hygiene. You know, the thought that we won't contaminate a sink is impossible. And if, you, if you've got a sink that isn't contaminated, then there's something wrong. That tells me more about hand hygiene than the 95% on the ward door of compliance that you often see. It's, it's more useful. So here we've got a splash radius, a meter from the sink. But actually, when you look at what they were doing here, they're actually mixing up. Oh, oh, it's, okay. it's a bit slower than that. Oh, go back one. So here they're mixing up the IV drugs. Oh, turned it black. Uh, where's the? I've gone horribly wrong now. Have I turned it off? I oh, turned it black. Okay. Ah, oh, yeah. So here they're mixing up the IV drugs. You know, and cleaning up the ANT tea tray, and here's the sink to wash your hands in a clean utility area. In in some cases, well, you can put up a barrier to stop a splash. I would argue, do you actually need a hand sink in that area at all? Because your hands should be clean when you go into a clean utility area, so why not just use an alcohol hand rub? So, you know, you, you can modify your environment if that's what you need to do, but if you're designing a new one, you just don't put them in. And if you go to the Netherlands now, there are hospitals uh, that now don't have sinks in critical care uh, because they're concerned about the gram negatives there. I mean, I love this paper when it first came out because it, it was a paper from uh, Sylvia Munoz Price and. Here we've got one toilet over here, and we have a sink next to the toilet and the sink near the entry door. And they were saying, we found a lot more carbon pen resistant organisms in this sink than this one. And, I, you know, and is it a splash from the aerosol from the, the toilet? There is a lid on it. Actually, I did read one paper, and I can't find it now, that shows when you flush with a lid down, yes, you don't get the local dispersal as much, but what you do get is what comes out goes further because there's actually a, the, the pressure is higher so, and it's going through a smaller gap, and I'd love to find that paper. But anyway, you know, is it aerosol from here, or is it, you know, the, is it going down the drain and coming back here, or could it be that the person who's just used that toilet might wash their hands <laughs> in the sink next to the toilet? <laughs> okay, now, so that was the original, my original thought about that, and that was their third theory, that somebody might wash their hands rather than walk here to use this one. But actually, if you look at this room, what on earth is going on in here? Why aren't we? And this is all, you know, within splash radius of, of you know, this is all in, in the blast radius. So why don't we go around and actually put a two meter line around the sink and say, don't store stuff in this area. How many times do you walk into a bay and see the blood pressure monitoring equipment parked there because it's a space if you're not using it. So then somebody does wash their hands, shock, horror and then it gets contaminated. So we're not, we're not, you know, we're good at scoring own goals, really, without thinking about it and without teaching people, you know, it's a dirty, disgusting area. And if you look at the, you know, all of the splashing you get around sink, I mean, I, you look at sink design as well. Why do we put a shelf on the sink? 
It's asking for people to put stuff there because it's a surface and often there aren't too many surfaces around because we don't want people to put stuff in, in places. So what we do then is create a shelf in the worst possible place to put stuff. So not brilliant. No, also notice all the things that are close to here and available to drop down the sink. You know, things like hand towels, etc. Look at drainage time. You know, how often do you actually get a Blanc sink? This is a paper from Ginny Moore and, uh, and Paz at Public Health England. Looking at, and now there were fewer bacteria dispersed from sinks that drain to the rear, but they get blocked and they're not put in very well. As, you know, we've just seen the photograph of, the, of them not matching up, so therefore you get blockage. You put a plastic piece in to stop the people blocking it, that'll get contaminated as well. That's not a problem. But also, you get slow drainage, so you get all this stuff down the sink and you get a lot more uh, dispersal because the water doesn't drain away, therefore, there's even more splashing from the sink. And it has to be absolutely blocked before you can get estates to come and look at it. Not, it's slow to drain, therefore there's more splashing, therefore this is a risk. So we don't jump on that one early enough, it's just when it stops working. And then it's days before you get them to come and see it as well. So, you know, they do definitely become, they come blocked. You know, we put the paper towel dispenser over the top of the sink, fine. Is it? Because what happens is people pull out a cheap paper towel and bits fall off and they fall into the sink and then they go down and they block it. So we're not great at thinking about how we're doing stuff as well. I was fascinated by this paper as well to actually look at what goes on at the sink. Some of you might have seen this one. Uh, this is, they videoed what was going on. Any idea what the percentage of activity at hand sink was hand hygiene? It's 4%. <laughs> 95 percent of the activity of the sink is not hand hygiene it's actually mostly feeding the bugs putting stuff down there to feed them yeah. uh, so drainage of IV bags including medications sticking drinks down there that sort of stuff they all go down there cleaning of medical of items so you put something medical into the sink to clean it uh, Cleaning of the sink was actually less than 1% of all activities, less than once a day, and, but actually the cleaning staff would use it to put the cleaning stuff in. So they walk into the room and put the cloth they were going to be using in the sink so they could then contaminate the rest of the room with whatever's in the sink. That's in the patient room. In the patient bathroom, placement of medical items was, a, was quite a lot, uh, an eighth of all activity. Hand hygiene, 2% of all activity. Cleaning the sink, very low. Patients' personal items. I'm just going to take you into the bathroom so you can wash and get freshen up for the day. So I'll put your face flannel and your toothbrush in the sink for you when, they, when you get there. So then you pre-contaminate somebody's toothbrush and what a surprise. So the sink's just a, a surface. And people don't think of it as this is a dirty disposal area. If it looked like a sluice hopper, they probably wouldn't do it. If it looked like a toilet, they probably wouldn't do it. You know, who would put their toothbrush on the back of the loo just to, you know, it's a surface. They don't do that because they think that's dirty, but they don't think a sink is dirty because they associate it with cleaning something, like cleaning their hands. So not, not brilliant. We actually did a little bit of work on this because I've always been interested in the, the feeding the sink thing. And um, so if you only feed the sink, if you don't actually feed the sink, is there enough organic matter coming off hands to actually still grow biofilm? Um, and we had part of Nightingale 2 that actually wasn't used for patients. Well, we had a lot of Nightingale 1 that wasn't used for patients. <laughs> um, but there was a lot more hand sinks. And so they were flushing water down it. And um, so after eight weeks, Ginny Moore came up um, with a colleague, Charlotte, and they did some sampling. And we took the part of them, and that clean as a whistle. Um, we did grow a Pseudomonas oleiforans from them, from one of them, but that was all. Uh, whereas the one that was used for hand, hand hygiene only, and I'm fairly confident, even though I can't be 100% because I wasn't standing there all day every day, but they would have had to walk past sluices to get to the hand sink, which was by the nurse's station and by the computer. So it, you'd have to walk past a lot of people to dispose of stuff. Uh, and after eight weeks, it was like this. So, not, not a, so I think there probably is enough nutrients coming off your, your soap and your hands anyway to grow stuff. We grew lots of coliforms from this, including a Klebsiella pneumonia that we didn't know we had as, from a patient. Um, so yeah, but it's, it means people are washing their hands, so that's good. So then, just thinking about what we can do, can we make it effective? Well, do we know what we're doing? Is that already doing is effective? You know, because that's a good way of making sure you're actually doing what you can. Uh, do we really know what's going on? Can we make it easier to do the right thing? I mean, the cleaners have these nice trolleys with everything equipped so they can go out and do stuff. 
Because the nurses don't have anything like this, and they have to do quite a lot of cleaning and decontamination because there's a lot of equipment that goes from person to person. So what chance of the nurses going to get the right equipment the first time, you know, every time they're going to be using it, and are they going to get their dilutions right? Well, then also, is, is the actual item they're cleaning or the item anybody is cleaning actually cleanable? Did anybody think about that with a pre purchase questionnaire? I used to read the local paper at my local um, when I was working in the hospital to see what the League of Fiends had just bought the hospital that you couldn't then decontaminate because nobody asked us. And we go along and say, no, you can't do that. I still remember the cystoscope that somebody donated to the spinal unit so they could do it locally to make it easier. And the, um, the flower trough they bought from B&Q to stick glutaraldehyde in in the corner of the room without talking to anybody. It's just your nose is a bit of a giveaway, <laughs> that, that one. You know, staff will damage things, things get old, materials will cause, that we use will cause damage and because a lot of the stuff we have were not actually originally intended to be um, you know, cleaned and disinfected in that way and time takes a toll. You know, instructions used to be clean in line with the local policy. Why do they know what the local policy is, the manufacturers of the equipment? You know, consult your local infection control team, not helpful. And that other thing is people are actually starting to clean stuff now. Whereas a few years they didn't, so then you get problems because when you start doing stuff, then it all comes out of the woodwork. Sometimes we do need to clean and disinfect. Sometimes we change the product, the agent. So you might be using detergent, and then you think, oh, we'll switch to chlorine. And then, oh, there's some hydrogen peroxide around, we'll try that. No, maybe we'll try paracetic acid, then we'll try gas, then we'll try UVC. I wouldn't mind betting half the kit was never designed with any of that in mind, and that is a problem, and new formulations are coming along all the time. Uh, here's an outbreak from Oxford, uh, the Candidorus one, quite famous one where the top, uh, pulse oximeter, oh sorry, the, the temperature uh, monitoring probe was actually the, uh, 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 the, the problem. It's a non-critical device, only touches intact skin, you know, but the problem was how cleanable was it? And when you look at it, the rubber was years old and it was all cracked and, you know, and crazed and it was actually uncleanable. The outbreak stopped when they took them out of use. Then the senior nurse went on holiday and they brought them back out of the cupboard and the outbreak started again because nurses don't chuck anything away. But you, you, you've got something there that's not cleanable but had got old. And times have definitely changed in manufacturing. I can remember these as a ventilator. It's easy to clean, it's a nice metal box, but it doesn't look very sexy. Look at this, whoa, that's much, much, <laughs> much nicer. And you can brand it and you can make it look a lot nicer. Well, that brings a lot of problems, yeah? Because design to manufacture takes three to five years. Lifespan's 10 years, possibly. 15 years ago, people weren't thinking, are we going to have to disinfect this? So I don't blame the manufacturers. And there's been lots of problems with compatibility with disinfectants from uh, you know, America, Australia, and here in the UK. And I got this slide from Stephen Doge from Draeger. So here's a, a ventilator, all the different types of plastics that are in this one here. 90 devices, 1,000 different disinfection relevant parts. There are, I think it was 29 different polymers on that. So have they tested all of them against the range of disinfectants we might want to use, and therefore you get damage? And, Actually, some industries were well ahead of us in recognizing the effect of, uh, of disinfection, but also biofilms on polymers and plastics. So here's a paper from 1998 looking at deterioration and biofilms on polymeric uh, materials. You often find you get a crack where the screw hole is, but the screw hole, maybe that's the pressure where somebody's tightened up the screw in the factory at the beginning, so you've got a pressure, a you know, stress crack coming that way. But maybe it's the fact that you can't get in there and clean it, so you've got a biofilm in there which is actually causing degradation of the polymers. So that's another example of where other people in other industries have been doing things. And their, their effect is when it's broken apart, it looks ugly. On my point, at that point, it's breaking and it's just not going to work. But this, this actually came out of the um, electrical industry because it affects conductivity of electrical cabling uh, as well. Lastly, can we prepare a patient zone safely enough? Brett Mitchell looked at this, there is a risk to the next patient if the previous occupant of the room had a particular infection. If I went back into my old hospital now, they probably would say, oh yeah, we remember you, you're a pain, we'll put you in a side room to get you out of the way, but out of courtesy to you. And I'd be going, actually, no, because the only people who get a side room are those who have got an infection. I'm not confident that they will have cleaned it properly. Yeah. What does nursing staff know about cleaning? Is it looking at ITU staff, who you know, generally are a fairly bright bunch? Half of them didn't know whose job it was to clean a non-critical item. One, only one in 20 could actually con correctly identify a non-critical item, yet chances are they were going to be responsible for cleaning it. 
A lot of them didn't know the difference between cleaning and disinfecting and sterilizing. Half of them didn't know to determine shelf life for disinfectants. Not helpful. And nurses generally don't clean very well. So we have to do some education, which I think Lena's going to be talking about this afternoon. 27 items cleaned by the clinical staff. 89% of them chain, uh, failed. You know, and ACE Nitobacter was actually the biggest risk to the next patient. ACE Nitobacter is a bit like your mother-in-law. Once it moves in, you really struggle to get rid of it. Uh, I did this uh, with my colleagues in Australia. We're looking at a qualitative piece of work. And the point about this one is most would not be confident being placed in a room with a previous patient that had been diagnosed with an infection. So you know, the staff know that's not great. So why are they not doing something about it? Yeah. I think we could do worse than talk to each other. I thought this was nice. I saw it on Twitter. Sophie, who's an infection control nurse in Gloucester, Gloucester actually went and spent a, a, a day with the cleaners to actually learn about cleaning. And I think we could talk to each other a lot more and learn and, and appreciate the skills of others. You do have to do things, you see, to make them work. And this is a paper looking at disinfectant wipes. And I'm not worried about that bit. I, what I like about this paper is the fact that they actually measured, did people do it? And you rarely see that on a paper. Sometimes you'll see, we did this and it didn't work, or we did this and it did work. You don't really know if they did it or not. Here, they said, when they got cleaning compliance to over 80%, then you got a significant reduction in MRSA, VRE, and C. diff, although anything was good for VRE. So I, it's measuring whether people do things well or, or not. You know, and that's still saying you know, anything up to 80 is really not going to work. Well, you would hope that people would want to do a bit better than that. Mark Rupp did this um, piece of work years ago, he looked at the time taken in an isolation room to clean it and, and using ultraviolet dots how well it was done. And if there was any correlation between time and, clean, and effectiveness, there'd be a line here, but there's nothing. So over an hour, 20% of sites, 20 minutes, 80% of sites. Nobody got above that, though. So we're not, we're not great at systems. And I was, I was interested in systems. This is a paper from Claire Rock at Johns Hopkins. Median time to clean a room, 49, uh, 14 minutes, but median number of surfaces, 70%. 70 so nothing is perfect. But what they're missing is all the high touch surfaces. So that's the education's not going very well. Uh, so do the cleaning staff actually know what they are? They looked at barriers, the type of the unit and family members and the cleaning patterns. And the cleaning patterns were interesting. But interruptions while cleaning actually was, was a major barrier. So people don't see it as an important job at all. That's not helpful. Um, there were some uh, aspects of practice that weren't great, but it's like the microfiber cloths, which many people use. Some were folding it correctly, and some were just not folding it at all, so they looked at uh, practice there. What I was interested in is though the cleaning patterns. So how do people do it? So some do it either clockwise or anti-clockwise. Some do it in horizontal or vertical way. Some do it in a completely random way, and some will just go in and do a little bit and then go out. The bathroom, you know, if you're going clean to dirty, should be done last. 14% cleans first, 11 in the middle, and okay, three quarters were last. But even the cleaners themselves were not consistent. So they looked at the patterns of the, of the actual cleaners themselves, and some were very good and would go about it in a, in a rational way. So here we go, this one here, you know, they, they, they do it exactly the same way every time. But if you look at the others, it's completely random every time in the way that they clean the room and which order they do the bathroom. So there's a lot to be done with training, I think. You know, if you know you've got 15 minutes to clean a room, or it takes 15 minutes to clean a room, and you've only got five, what are you going to do? Which bits do you choose? And I bet the cleaners, the cleaning staff might pick different things to what I would say they should clean. So there's a lot more we can learn from that. So I, 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 I like going to conferences. I like posters. Here's a couple of my favorites from a recent one. Here's one from uh, Plymouth, where they actually redesigned and just changed the use of some rooms to actually make a cleaning and decontamination room so you could actually clean and then separate off the reassembly and separate off the storage instead of cleaning it and then leaving it in the same room it's cleaned by. And it didn't take too much. It cost them about £40,000 to put in a, a, a wall and a, and a bit of stuff, but they costed that as less than the outbreak they'd had that actually promoted that, so that was good. And this was a really nice piece of work by Anne Kaluwerts in Brussels where her hospital actually asked her how how many hours should, of cleaning time should we have? And I've never been asked that. Yep. Uh, so what she did was she used ultraviolet dots, timed how long it took to clean a room and what percentage of effectiveness it was, and went back to them and said, if you want it to be 80% effective or above, that's the number of hours, which turned out to be twice what they currently had. But what she said to them was, which I thought was good, was 
If you want the hospital to be cleaned well, that's the number of hours. If you choose not to put that number of hours in, it means your hospital is not going to be cleaned well. And that's changing the language, I think. Saying to people, no, you can't do that, sometimes makes them go, I'm going to ignore you. But if you, I think if you say, here's the information that I'm giving you so that you can make the decision you're going to be accountable for, because that's what she did, she threw it back on the managers, made it very difficult for them to say, no, we're not going to do that. So I thought, that, I thought that was a nice piece of work. And she got the money, and she got the cleaning staff uh, for that. And they're writing that one up. So look, look for that one in a proper publication. Anyway, thank you. Managed to do it. Thank you.